So, it's time to acknowledge the big elephant in the room. It's been a good minute since I've made a video, huh? Well, I'm honestly blown away. When I made the Quad Run video, I was at about 80 subscribers. I did not expect to be at over a thousand at this point. You guys don't even know how much I greatly appreciate that. And actually, let me ask you guys a question. What kind of content do you guys want to see on my channel? What was your guys' favorite content that you've seen on here so far? Let me know, and I'm going to get more of that content to you guys. So, anyway, with that said, you guys don't even know how much I appreciate that. And even if there was only one person watching my video, that would still be motivation enough for me to keep going and making videos. But the fact that I have over a thousand people watching my videos, I'm blown away here. So, anyway, let's get right to business and let's get our next video started. What's going on guys? This is Poacher coming at you with another video. So I was a big fan of Toy Story when it first came out. It was a big deal. It was the first computer animated movie and it was the first Pixar movie ever made. So anyway, I remember my fifth birthday party was actually Toy Story themed. What'd you get? Toy Story! Because I was honestly a big fan of the movie. I had all the toys. I even had the Sega Genesis game. Now, let's talk about that for a second. The Genesis game actually came out the same day as the movie came out, so it had some big shoes to fill, but the question is, it's the Sega Genesis, and the movie was computer animated. How do you make a game based on a movie that's computer animated? You got some big shoes to fill there, so I'm kind of curious now. Let's check it out. When a game console reaches the end of its lifespan, you tend to see more games that push the limits of the hardware. By now, the console has already been out for a number of years, and the game developers gain more experience on how to program for it. As a result, you see impressive looking games that might look like night and day compared to earlier titles on the same platform. So what exactly does pushing the hardware limits really mean? Well, the graphics are usually better, more color on the screen, nice parallax scrolling in the background. Sometimes you might see certain effects being pulled off like scaling and rotation, which look really cool. And it can especially be impressive when it's performed on a console that doesn't support those features. So there's no official rule on what's considered pushing the limits and what isn't. It's your own discretion, but game developers were making games that were looking more and more impressive as time went on. Sometimes it's because of competition. When the NES was launched, for an example, Atari started incorporating features into their own games that were standard in NES games. For an example, some of the later 2600 games actually had title screens and an options menu. Before that, you had to look at an instruction manual to figure out what option you wanted to select. Also, some games like Solaris were graphically impressive for the 2600. Sometimes it's a marketing strategy. Impressive looking games are going to draw more eyeballs, especially if you put gameplay screenshots in magazines or show footage in commercials. A good example is Batman Return of the Joker on NES. This game looked graphically impressive for the time. Batman was very well animated for an example, and many stages had moving clouds which gave the illusion of parallax scrolling. The game overall has a lot of color which is impressive considering the NES's limited color palette. So a game like this is obviously going to look great in magazines. However, in the case of one company, the majority of their games stood out from the rest, and it seemed like they wanted all of their games to leave a lasting impression. In 1990, the game publisher Psygnosis was shown a demo for the Amiga called Pugs in Space. The demo featured a short red alien named Pugsy. The company was impressed with what they saw in the demo, so they recruited the creator of the demo, Dionysus, to make a game based on the character. Dionysus' original plan was to make a game that resembled Little Big Planet. However, this would end up being too difficult for the group to handle, so Dionysus ended up dropping out of the project, unfortunately. 
However, Psygnosis still wanted to see this character come to life in a game, so they recruited a fairly new game company at the time, Traveler's Tales, to make this game instead. Traveler's Tales took the character and went in a different direction with him. Rather than make a game like Little Big Planet, they created a standard side-scroller that played more like Super Mario World, where you could pick up items and drop them. The game was actually super advanced, the physics were pretty on point, the way the items bounce across the screen really shows how much effort they put into making the physics seem accurate to real life. And each item has its own properties like weight, friction, and so on. Some of the visuals look unbelievable for the Genesis too. The full motion rocket ship scene at the beginning looks more like something you would see in a PS1 game rather than the Genesis. The first stage boss also has a really impressive rotating ship. Remember, the Genesis doesn't have scaling or rotation, and there's no Mode 7 here, so seeing this in a Genesis game is mind-blowing. So Pugsy ended up being released on the Genesis, Sega CD, and the Amiga. A Super Nintendo version was created, but was never completed or released. While the game did receive some favorable reviews, it didn't sell well, unfortunately. Despite the game not meeting expectations, this still did establish a good relationship between Psygnosis and Traveler's Tales, and they would continue working together in future games. Traveler's Tales did a fantastic job with this game, to be honest with you, especially considering they were tasked to make a game based off a short demo that they didn't even create. The two companies would grow even further when they reached an agreement with Disney Interactive Studios, allowing them to make Disney-themed games. Making a Disney game is actually going to be much harder than you might think. This is an officially licensed game after all, you need to put your best cards out for this one. And they did, with Mickey Mania, which was Traveler Tales' very next game. So you can tell they really went the extra mile with this one. The game pays homage to all of the older Mickey Mouse cartoons, including Steamboat Willie, The Mad Doctor, and a few others. In the Steamboat Willie stage, it starts out black and white, and it slowly gains color as you progress through the stage. Pretty cool, honestly. And Mickey is very well animated here. It almost feels like you're playing a real cartoon. Now, like with Pugsy, Traveler's Tales really pushed the limits of the Genesis with some cool effects. For an example, in the Mad Doctor stage, you navigate through a rotating tower. Even the platforms have a 3D-like movement. Now, this isn't the first time we've seen an effect like this in a game, but it's really cool to see from a newer game company. In the Moose Hunter stage, you get an auto-scroller stage where you interact with a 3D environment. On a console with no Mode 7 support, this is really impressive to see. Some common complaints from players are that this game's a little too easy, and if you're not a die-hard Mickey Mouse fan, you may not find this game to be very interesting. But for a first Disney licensed game by Traveler's Tales, this exceeded my expectations. They could have taken a mediocre platformer and thrown Mickey Mouse into it, but they actually put a lot of care and effort into this to please Disney fans, and I can really appreciate what they did here. Now, making a game based on Disney's own mascot was already a hard project, but Traveler's Tales' next assignment was going to be their most difficult one yet. In January of 1993, production of Toy Story began. Some animators thought the movie would be a disappointment. Billy Crystal, who was originally supposed to play Buzz Lightyear, turned down the role because he thought a fully computer animated movie wouldn't do well. This would be the first time a movie would be made in this style. This would also be the first time a Disney movie wasn't made in-house. Given that Toy Story was the first of its kind, no one was 100% sure how well this movie would do in theaters. It was a risk to make a game based off a movie that wasn't out yet. Not to mention, you're not going to have that many resources when a movie doesn't exist yet. Despite that, Traveler's Tales chose to do the unthinkable and start working on a Toy Story game for home consoles. They did have some success with Mickey Mania, but could a Toy Story game be their big break? Or would it be a financial flop? Mm -hmm. 
Making a game based on a movie that wasn't released yet was met with some challenges. The cartoony graphics of Mickey Mania fit really well with the franchise because it matched the old Mickey Mouse shorts, but a Toy Story game would have to match the computer animation style of the movie. How do you do that on the Sega Genesis with console limitations and a smaller color palette? Fortunately, they did receive some help from Pixar, who sent Traveler's Tales some animations of Woody and some 3D rendered art. However, while the artwork was perfectly fine for the movie, the lighting of the animations in 3D art was not correct, so the developers at Traveler's Tales couldn't put them in the game. It wasn't until two weeks before the game would be presented to Sega did Pixar finally send the properly lit 3D rendered art. This would be a big risk for Traveler's Tales, because if the game didn't get approval from Sega the first time, the release would be delayed further and it would no longer be able to come out on the same day as the movie. If approved by Sega and released in time, this would be the first time in history that a movie and corresponding game came out on the same day. But doing this was a risk, because no one was certain if the movie would be successful. If the movie bombs, the game bombs as well, and keep in mind, this is only Traveler's Tales' second Disney game. So John Burton, who was the CEO of Traveler's Tales, wanted this game to get approval from Sega the first time, so he came up with a clever trick. If the game ran into an issue during gameplay and was going to crash during the meeting with Sega, it would instead redirect to a bonus stage. This way, all game-breaking glitches would look like it's just part of the game, rather than an accident. Due to these efforts, Traveler's Tales was able to get the approval from Sega, and the game was released on the same day as the movie, just like they originally planned. On November 22nd, 1995, the movie was released in theaters. The movie did extremely well, greatly above expectations. Steve Jobs, who owned Pixar at the time, said that if the movie grossed $75 million at the box office, he would have broke even, and if it made $100 million, him and Disney would have made money. How much did the movie actually make? $350 million. A lot of viewers praised the animation style, and future movies would be made in this way. The movie did extremely well, and as a 5-year-old, I loved it. When I got this movie on VHS, I used to watch it constantly. Speaking of the VHS release, there actually was an advertisement at the beginning for the Genesis and Super Nintendo game, and that's how I originally found out about it. So with that said, the movie did well, but what about the game? I don't even know where to start here. They pulled off the look of the movie so well, and you can tell by the gameplay footage how much variety there actually is here. It's a pretty basic platformer, yeah, but there's nothing wrong with that. Now, Woody's attack is actually kind of creative. You swing around his pole string, and you can tie up enemies with it temporarily. What I don't get though, is how you can tie them up and then just walk away. Isn't the string supposed to be attached to Woody, right? Whatever, it's a game. You can use your pole string as a grappling hook too, so I really like how they implemented this. The graphics here are unbelievable. Not only does it look like the style of the movie, but the 3D background, I'm amazed that they were able to pull this off. In between each stage, you get a cutscene with a few still shots from the movie. As a kid, I thought it was really cool that they had actual shots from the movie and on the Genesis too, which has a limited color palette, so this is really cool to see. Every stage in this game has so much detail, I love looking at the posters in Sid's room for an example, and I also enjoyed looking at the decorations, like the books and the random stuff on the shelves. The 3D stage blew my mind as a kid. There's no Super FX chip or SVP chip making this possible, so this was all done using the native Genesis hardware. Overall, in the graphics department, this could have passed as a PS1 game, but it's not. Surprisingly, this game follows the plot of the movie to a T. Pretty much every scene in the movie has been recreated in this game, even scenes you wouldn't expect to make an appearance. Remember when Sid shined a magnifying glass on Woody? 
Well, I dare you to watch this with a straight face. Hot, hot, hot. The only difference with this part though is that here, you have to dodge obstacles while not being able to stop Woody from running. So this scene is exaggerated a little bit compared to the movie, but I like the creativity. You can tell that Traveler's Tales wanted to pack more content in this game because some scenes didn't even happen in the movie. Remember when Woody had a nightmare about a flying buzz attacking Woody? I don't, but I admire the extra effort and detail. And the scene where Woody is riding Rex? That didn't happen in the movie either, and I love that Traveler's Tales has a sense of humor. This didn't happen in the movie, but I wish it did. In the Pizza Planet stage, they really got it right. In this stage, you have to duck when a human walks by so they don't catch you. This is extremely accurate to the plot of the movie. In the Revenge of the Toys stage, all of Woody's friends are against him, and you even take damage when you touch them. This might seem weird because in the beginning stages they don't hurt you, but this is on point with the movie. Now here's another example of a scene being exaggerated a bit. The claw machine stage is divided into three parts. That's a little weird when you think about the movie. This stage is called Inside the Claw Machine, and the 3D stage is called Really Inside the Claw Machine. Okay, what? I mean, in the movie, when Woody goes inside the claw machine, he's just there. None of these previous scenes happened at all. But I'm not complaining, I'm just poking fun at all the extra content that Traveler's Tales added. Really, I love that they went the extra mile with this. I mentioned before how much variety there is, and I stand by that. It's not just a platformer, you also have stages where you control the RC car, and then you have the auto-scroller that I mentioned before where you ride Rex, and that 3D stage where you have to collect all of the little green men. Even the Pizza Planet stage offers something a little different. You may notice all the stars in the levels. Now, I'm not a big fan of collectathons, but this is one of the few games that did it right. If you collect all 50 stars in a stage, you get a free life. And when you collect 300 stars total, you get a continue. And you start off with no continues in this game, so they really make you work for it. Considering how difficult this game is, collecting the stars and earning your free lives is imperative to reaching the later levels. That's the one thing that everyone can agree on. This game is unbelievably difficult. The claw machine stage especially is ridiculous. Here, you have to keep Buzz on the ground and prevent him from being taken by the claw. If Buzz is taken all the way to the edge of the screen, you lose. What makes this stage so enraging is that Buzz gets moved closer and closer to the edge every time the claw comes by, and there's no way to move him back. Once he's there, he's there. I've had some really good runs where I reach this stage with 9 lives and then I proceed to lose 8 of them here. What I really don't get though is that Woody and Buzz get captured by the claw anyway, that's how they end up in Sid's house, so this makes this entire stage completely pointless. Another stage I had trouble with when I was a kid was the RC one. Here you have to run over Buzz and collect the battery he drops before you run out of gas. I don't have any issues with the stage anymore. But as a kid, I just couldn't get the controls down, and I had to have my older brother beat this stage for me. Apparently, Traveler's Tales knew this game was difficult, and when they released this game in Europe afterwards, they added a password system to make it a little bit easier. Now if the US version had a password system, it would have been great as a kid so that I could practice that RC stage more. Now even though I don't have any problems with this stage, it's one of the few levels where I don't bother to collect all 50 stars because I risk dying if I try. I give a lot of credit in the sound and music department. Now outside of You Got A Friend In Me, I cannot think of a single track from the movie that stands out to me, but they did a really good job with the music in this game, and a lot of the tracks really capture the mood of the stage that you're on. So this game uses a lot of toy-like sound effects, like bouncing balls, Lego pieces falling on the ground, things like that. It actually makes it more fun to interact with the game. Yeah. 
There's also a lot of voice synthesis here. You hear a lot of lines from Buzz especially. You don't want to be in the way when my laser goes off. Now in most games, it would probably sound like a jumbled mess, but the voice clarity is actually quite good here. This game does have a few beginner traps in it. In stage 2, for example, you're supposed to get all the toys into the toy box before Andy walks in by bouncing them off this trampoline pump thing. The first time playing, you're probably not going to know what to do, and you'll most likely lose. Some players might get discouraged and say, well, this game sucks, I'm not going to play anymore. But if you give it a chance, you're going to be rewarded with a fantastic game. And that's where I'm going to leave it, this is a fantastic game. Not only does this game follow the movie very well, but it looks like the movie too. And that's impressive considering this is the Sega Genesis. Traveler's Tales went above and beyond, get it, beyond? By adding additional content that was either exaggerated from the movie, or not from the movie at all. And there's so much variety here too. Not only did I like this game as a kid, but I do as an adult as well. When this game was released, it did really well selling millions of copies according to John Burton. John Burton and his team continued to work on more projects. Shortly after Toy Story, their work was noticed by Sega, and they recruited Traveler's Tales to make a final Sonic game for the Genesis. The result was Sonic 3D Blast, which did receive mixed reviews, but was also a commercial success. In 1999, they made a sequel to the first Toy Story game on the N64 and PS1, which was a tie-in with Toy Story 2. In 2007, Traveler's Tales was acquired by Time Warner Interactive Studios, but Burton was still involved in the production of games, including the LEGO Batman and LEGO Star Wars series. In 2007, John Burton created a YouTube channel called Game Hut, where he would discuss his past projects, including prototypes he worked on, cancelled games, commentaries, unseen artwork, and my personal favorite? Coding Secrets, where he talks about certain effects that he pulled off in his past games. For example, he talks about how he created the 3D effect in the Moose Hunter stage, as well as the rotating tower in the Mad Doctor stage, both in Mickey Mania. In Toy Story, he explained how he pulled off the 3D stage, how he created some of the music, and how he was able to include actual movie shots without losing so much quality. That's only scraping the surface. He's also covered the effects in Pugsley, and other games I didn't talk about in this video. It's really cool, honestly, to see a former CEO come out and join a community like this and share his experiences all to us. We're basically getting a director's cut of our favorite childhood games for free on YouTube. If there's anyone I recommend checking out, it's John Burton himself. Him and his company have done some great work. Hey, what's up guys? Before I end the video, I wanted to go over a few life updates that have been going on. This has been maybe the last two or three months, and maybe this will explain my absence a little bit. So, at work, we have been really backed up because we had two people leave. Me and one other guy have been basically running the fort. Um, right now, I'm working seven days a week. It's been extremely difficult to find the time to make new videos. I used to bust out videos on my days off and I'd grind for the whole night until I made a lot of progress. And I do my best work at night. Now that I don't have that luxury anymore since I work at night, it has greatly affected my productivity when it comes to videos. I've been basically trying to grind it out either in the morning before I go to work, or sometimes I'll even bring the laptop to work and try to work on it then. But I'm very limited on that. Secondly, I'm actually a student now. I'm going to school part-time, and keep in mind I work full-time. 
I'm actually struggling in school right now. There's one particular class I need a lot of assistance with. And because of that, that also has been greatly affecting my productivity when it comes to making videos. When I first started doing this, I was making one video a week. At the time, work was going really well. We were not backed up and I had three days off a week. So I had a lot of time to make that happen. Eventually that one video a week dropped down to about one video every two weeks, but people didn't seem to mind because the videos were twice as long and that was nice for everyone. It was great. I can't make that happen anymore. That doesn't mean I'm gonna quit. I can't give you guys a guarantee about how often I can make videos. Still trying to manage this, but I just wanted to give you guys an update. I apologize about the lack of videos. You guys are a big priority to me, literally. It's school and then you guys next. Hopefully you guys can understand that. So with that said, I greatly appreciate your guys' patience. I apologize about how long this video took and I really can't make a guarantee over when the next one is going to come out. I'm gonna try to come up with a schedule. Anyway, with that said, thank you for watching. Have a good one, you guys.